Good morning, folks. As you watch the incoming Southern Hemisphere on our star, we're gearing up to discuss earthquakes today, atmospheric forcing, the oceans, and explosions in space. We are starting with the sun, and luckily space weather indices are pretty much all flatlined. Things are quiet with no flaring on the sun, and the solar wind arriving at Earth is pretty calm too. Looking ahead, we may get minor solar wind variations due to coronal sectors, but the next chance for action would be if the sunspots begin to grow. Bright spot there incoming has small sunspots beneath it. Showed nothing two days ago, so perhaps she is in a growth phase. South of that, we've got twin filaments competing to make coronal cavities. This is what freaks out newcomers into thinking there's a dark sphere next to the sun. In reality, it's a spherical cavity magnetically evacuated by the same force holding the filaments straight up. And when there's two of them next to each other, they swing plasma through to let us see it's actually nothing, not a UFO sucking on the sun. Folks, the earthquakes continue in Oceania and South America, not moving location much and concentrated down at the low velocity zone of the mantle. Both blood echoes yet again. We've discussed our earthquake forecasting, but let's give credit to another group bringing the new science together, an electrodynamic pre-earthquake warning system, but this one wholly based on the atmospheric signals and the total electron content. Those energetic signatures also show up in pressure cells and outgoing long wave radiation, and therefore looking at a total electron content model is kind of like a blend of the forcing factors on two of the three location forecasting techniques we use at QuakeWatch.net. Of course, the third of those blood echoes. Now speaking of electron content in the atmosphere, the solar working of it plays a huge role in the weather and the climate. We know particle flux directly changes the atmospheric currents, but they can also be excited to different levels based on solar light energy. These are mostly subtle, but if any of you recall our threshold event discussion with X-ray solar flare irradiance, think of it like cook temp for chicken. Before it, the chicken is pink and bacteria filled, but after the threshold, the chicken is never the same in color, texture, bacterial content, etc. It's changed. This is like large solar flares, which from the standpoint of the global electric circuit, might as well be a particle injection directly from magnetospheric compression. It's electromagnetic coupling. We're moving on next to a review article on recurrent nova and the way the authors are stretching, angling, and insisting that binaries are still the best candidates for recurrent nova. You can tell they're scared of all the 2020 non-binary recurrent nova science that threatens their PhD theses and life's work. Calm down, doctors. Now is not the time for fear. That comes later. What's come already and you learn about in part two of our recent series is that the changes in the sun's nearby environment can act the same as an accreting binary to make a nova event. No degenerate binary necessary. No binary at all. A lonely star that wandered into a dust cloud and exploded. We saw about 12 examples in 2020 that make us look at the cycles identified in part one of our recent series and ask if the sun is the culprit in part two. Lastly on the science front are two articles describing how little they understand about the Beaufort gyre and how they're figuring out how many mistakes they're making. Sadly, the one thing that isn't a mistake is that when it releases, we're going to get a cold climate bomb unleashed in the world. It's at a record time and change in its weight to unleash. Learn more about that and the sun's influence on the weather and our climate in the climate playlist. That's right below the video. That next disaster playlist is under the video as well. Now, there were a ton of questions about Observer Ranch yesterday. If you emailed me about the back 40 acres, I'll be sending out information next week. But to answer the two most pressing questions we got, no, this is not a private compound. It's a public campground that doubles as the Observer's Education and Event Center. Public. And as for the survival structures, I know I showed in the video the A-frame cabins for the campground no, that is not the air Crete underground bunker structures we're considering as an example feature for survival. If you missed the info video yesterday, it is on the homepage of ObserverRanch.com. Things are moving quickly if you want to get involved. I'll see you in the morning. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.